Petition circulators for a Republican candidate face felony charges, accused of forging the signatures of everyone from dead people to a former district attorney. An extra billion bucks in state tax revenue. How much of it goes back to taxpayers will be up to voters. A hospital can't send a patient home if they don't have one. So Denver Health is building a place for people to go so they don't come right back. There's just this inextricable link between one's housing and one's health. And the state of Colorado would like to check you for ticks. Well, you can do the checking, but if you find ticks, the state wants you to mail them in. Sometimes the news is weird, and it's always next. Perhaps they thought the voters wouldn't care, seeing how they're dead and all. Several petition circulators for Republican candidates are now facing felony charges, accused of forging the signatures of dead people and, quite foolishly, a former prosecutor. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. When Carl Anderson ran to be the Republican nominee for Congress last year, his campaign hired a signature gathering firm called Grassfire to get 1,500 registered Republicans to sign this petition to qualify him for the ballot. The voters needed to live within the eight counties that make up Congressional District 7. Gola Maroof used to live in this area. Used to. I lived in Colorado from 2000, up until 2019. He goes by Maroof and was not even living in Colorado anymore when he supposedly signed Anderson's petition four times in four different handwriting styles. It's kind of like a photo identification or some kind of lineup thing, like, is this your signature? And I confirm none of them were. I got a phone call asking if I signed a petition with respect to CD7 and uh, I really had no idea what he was talking about. This is Pete Weir. His name and signature show up here, Peter Weir. Except, as you can probably figure out, Weir did not sign the petition. And if you're going to forge someone's signature, maybe he's one of the names you do not fake. Marshall, I'm Pete Weir, and I was uh, the elected uh, district attorney for the first judicial district, which is Jefferson and Gilpin counties. I think this case shows that our system does work. Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold referred the petition signatures to the Attorney General's office for review. When Anderson turned in his petitions, there were 4,462 signatures. The Secretary of State's office rejected 3,400, leaving him with about 1,000, not enough to qualify for the ballot. He briefly sued to have a judge put him on the ballot. We suspected at that time there was forgery concerns, um, frankly, that that's the reason he was insufficient, because there are so many concerns with signatures. Especially the ones that showed up multiple times. I'm happy that he was not an identity theft, but he just forged my signature. Neither Anderson, the candidate, nor Grassfire, the signature collection company, are facing any charges. Anderson told me today he's been cooperating with investigators since last year. Grassfire is no longer in business. I should point out there was another candidate who ran for state house who had the same firm, and there are people who collected signatures for her race that are caught up in this. She is not accused of anything, and she had signatures removed from her petition but still had enough to be on the ballot and qualify and get elected to office. How long have you been reporting? on shady signature gathering in Colorado. Seven years now. I'm well versed in how this works. We've got a great catching system. We don't have a great prevention system. Right. I mean, the, the catch is after the fact when you yeah. start reviewing the signatures, but there's nothing in place necessarily that says, you know, when you sign something, oh, that's wrong, or the person who notarizes it. Wait a minute. These all look like they're the same handwriting. Well, I'm still going to, like, there's nothing in that process necessarily that prevents it from getting to the Secretary of State, but it's when it gets to the Secretary of State, then they start the review. I don't know how you stop it on the front end. You could do digital. I know Amber McReynolds, former Denver Elections, she once showed me there's an iPad that maybe you could do it digitally and know right then and there. Reject it, was, it right there. Yep. So that shady dude who cost you outside Trader Joe's right then, you know, boom, got it or didn't. I don't know. All right, we'll keep watching it, Marshall. Thank you. So Colorado briefly had a law that limited how much petition gatherers could get paid per signature because they were worried about a perverse incentive. So only so much of their total pay could be tied to the number of signatures they turn in. That law was struck down by a judge after a challenge from the small government think tank, the Independence Institute. The First Amendment says that the people have the right to petition the government. And that means that we have the right to find out a way to get petitions signed. In Colorado, the most efficient and cost-effective way is to contract by the line. The Independence Institute's John Caldera there told us today that he thinks that rather than limiting petition gathering on the front end, the state should just continue to focus on that back-end verification process. Coloradans could be in for bigger taper refunds than expected next year. Now, how much bigger? 
That's going to be up to voters in November. The state's economists dropped their new update today, a predicted surplus of $3.3 billion. That's about $600 million more than previously estimated. That could bump up next year's individual tax refunds by a couple hundred dollars per person. Exact amount, though, depends on whether or not voters pass the governor's property tax initiative in November. It's Prop HH. It's Democrats' 10-year property tax plan. It would use some of your Tabor refund to cut property taxes. And the initiative would change how Tabor refunds are distributed for just one year. So for that year, everyone would get the same amount, regardless of how much they paid in taxes. If the Democrats' Prop HH fails, then there would not be a cut in property taxes, and there would not be a cut in your Tabor refund. Hospitals and patients who live on the streets can get stuck in this, this cycle. For somebody who comes in to get treatment and gets discharged into a dangerous situation, then ends up right back at the hospital. Denver Health is so sick of this cycle, it's creating apartments. Here's Mark Salinger. In a city looking for solutions, a construction site provides some hope. A 655 Broadway is a building that used to be an old office building. On the corner of 6th and Broadway, a block away from the emergency room, fences block access to new apartments. We can't make people healthy um, without, w without housing. Dr. Sarah Stella treats patients every day as an internal medicine physician at Denver Health. She knows the reason she often sees the same people over and over. When people don't have a safe place to recuperate following hospitalization, um, they are likely to return to the emergency department in the hospital. Sometime next year, Denver Health will open 14 apartments in this converted office building to be used for transitional housing. Instead of staying in the hospital for weeks at a time, people experiencing homelessness who have nowhere else to go will be released to an apartment to continue recovering. They essentially are stranded in the hospital without a safe uh, place to be discharged to. Last year, Stella says Denver Health treated 7,000 patients experiencing homelessness, accounting for 30,000 visits to the hospital. She says the length of stay for someone who is unhoused is more than twice as long as someone who is housed. One of the most powerful things I could be doing as a physician uh, is advocating for the right housing and supports for my patients. One building, 14 apartments, and perhaps a new way to fix a problem. So we know that we can't solve homelessness in Denver, but we want to be part of the solution. Dr. Stella says that she wants to talk about this because she says we aren't having the right conversations about housing in Denver. These patients are often older with more serious medical conditions. They need care on top of housing. These apartments will also offer resources and that medical care. They describe them somewhere in between a shelter and a skilled nursing facility, Kyle. Mark, for all the conversation about whose job it is to solve the homelessness crisis in Denver, I don't know how many people before now were saying it's the hospital's job to solve it, but they clearly see a role because they're really up against it financially. Yeah, exactly. So Denver Health tells me about 30% of inpatients that they have right now stay for more than 30 days at a time, and a portion of those are people who are experiencing homelessness. Denver Health can't keep doing this financially. They say that they're running out of money and need to come up with a solution regardless of what it is. All right. Very interesting. Mark Salinger, thank you. Survivors of the Club Q shooting say the millions of dollars donated on their behalf is not getting to them fast enough. and They're struggling to cover basic expenses. Cooper survivors spoke in front of City Hall in Colorado Springs today, calling for all of the donations to go out immediately. A victim's job is to heal. It is not to beg for money. It is to have the money that was rightfully donated to us, provided to us. We shouldn't have to continue fighting just to survive every day after what we already had to survive back in November. The survivors at today's event say the $3.2 million donated to the Colorado Healing Fund should be completely dispersed to victims now. The fund says that more than $2 million has gone out, and they point out that the fund's distribution model from the beginning when donations came in was clear that some of the funding was going to be held in reserve for victims' long-term needs. We should note, Next Viewers raised $120,000 for the Colorado Healing Fund through a Word of Thanks campaign. The fund secured donors that are covering its overhead earlier this year, so those donations will be going in whole to those who are impacted. The Colorado Supreme Court just shot down a state law that allowed survivors of child sex abuse to sue decades later. This law created a three-year window beginning in 2022 where survivors of child sex abuse dating back to the 1960s could sue an abuser or an organization 
that knew or should have known about the abuse. Now the state Supreme Court says that act is unconstitutional because it violates Colorado's ban on retrospective legislation, a law that looks back too far into the past. So specifically, up until 1990, sex abuse claims were under a two-year statute of limitations. There are lawsuits that are pending under this new law. A lawyer told us they'll likely be dismissed because they're now past the original statute of limitations. Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert is once more trying to impeach President Joe Biden. She rolled out the articles of impeachment on the House floor within the last hour. President Biden has abandoned his duties to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed and upheld by presiding over an executive branch that is continuously and overtly and continuous, consistently refused to enforce the nation's immigration laws and secure the southern border. Boebert's attempting to force a House debate and a vote by all the members on her impeachment resolution. She claims that the Biden era practice of releasing migrants into the U.S. while they await court hearings on asylum is a violation of federal law. The policy has already been blocked by federal judges and is currently going through an appeals process. Last year, Boebert tried to impeach Biden for his handling of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. A former visiting professor at CU might lose his law license over his attempt to overthrow American democracy. A look at how much of Colorado's bad air is coming from out of state. And the state has a very personal request. If you get bit by a tick this summer, they want to see it. The former visiting scholar at CU, the man who wrote the blueprint for former President Trump to overturn the 2020 presidential election, is now fighting to keep his law license. The California State Bar wants John Eastman disbarred for what he did. The case hinges largely on the memo he wrote pushing Vice President Mike Pence to refuse to certify Joe Biden's win. Attorneys are also highlighting comments that Eastman made at the Stop the Steal rally on January 6, arguing that what he said out there helped to incite the insurrection. His disciplinary hearing started today, expected to last several days. If the judge recommends any discipline against Eastman, the California Supreme Court would have to approve it. We are breathing a lot of secondhand smoke in Colorado these days, really all across the West. And now a NOAA study shows us just how much lingering wildfire smoke contributes to our bad air quality days when it mixes with ozone. So here's a smoky day from late August of 2021. There was Western wildfire smoke in the air that day. There was also ground level ozone. That year, it was above EPA limits on a record number of days. NOAA researchers looked at the ozone levels up high where the smoke was, and they found that a significant amount of ozone was transported by the smoke and mixed down at surface level where we'd breathe it. In July of that year, more than 10% of our ozone was coming from wildfire smoke. You talk about how that works. So compounds created by wildfires mixed with compounds that come from oil and gas operations and even from natural vegetation. Mix that with sunlight and warm temperatures. That reacts, creates ozone. Without the extra ozone as a result of the wildfires, Stay's lead author estimates that Denver's high ozone days will be cut in half. He says that doesn't let other polluters off the hook. It makes it even more critical to control the ozone we have some control over uh, if we're going to have more and more of this totally non-controllable ozone wafting in from somewhere else. So we really have to work harder to, to, to take care of what we can control. Dr. Andrew Langford there from NOAA warns that you can see the smoke, smell the smoke sometimes, but you can't see or smell the ozone. So he urges people, especially in sensitive groups, to check the air quality monitors, like the one from the state health department, before they're outside for long periods of time. Uh, Daniel, we, we were under ozone alert yesterday yep. into today. Yep. Wasn't wasn't a horrible day like we saw so no. many of in, in 2021, but this is kind of like our first dip into the bad air season. And it's going to continue at least throughout the next 24 hours or so. We're going to be in the thick of it before we get some thunderstorms in to help kind of cleanse the atmosphere, if you will. Uh, good news is all of that moves in as we look ahead toward uh, later tomorrow afternoon into the evening. Today, however, whew, it was hot, 85. That's our average high, 99, the record high. We did see a couple of spots in the 90s, those primarily into the southeastern corner of the state, 70s and low 80s up in the mountains, and it was sizzling in Grand Junction. Tonight, not a lot going on on HD Doppler 9. Couple of storms just beginning to fire up off to the eastern plains, but we're really keeping our eyes out for this system parked across the Pacific Northwest. That will make a line drive into Colorado late tomorrow, and that is what we're going to be watching for, not only for some thunderstorms here to kind of help mix out the atmosphere, get rid of some of that ozone, but also could bring us 
some severe thunderstorms, especially across the eastern plains into the panhandle of Nebraska. Parts of Kansas, too, you can see just outside of downtown Denver, out toward DIA, we're looking at a slight risk. Large hail, some pretty damaging winds, and can't rule out seeing potentially a tornado or two tomorrow afternoon and into the evening. Again, tonight into tomorrow, it's beautiful. We'll wake up to some sunshine here in the city and really a good chunk of your day. You're looking mighty fine by six, seven o'clock. That's when these thunderstorms start bubbling up here in the city and really intensify as they track off to the eastern side of the state. And they could continue late Wednesday night into Thursday. Temps pretty much on par with what we saw the past couple of days into the 80s. But again, once that cold front swings through, it'll cool us off and it also will be bringing us uh, a stormy day on Thursday at 75. We bounce back, though. The sunshine returns and the 80s for the weekend. There's a lot that we know we don't know. They're talking ticks. If you find them this summer, the state would really appreciate it if you'd mail that bugger in. Next. Next time you're in the wild, check for ticks. And if you find them, the state health department would really appreciate you mailing them in. The state health department wants to track the ticks found here and what diseases they may carry. The state has collected ticks found by veterinarians for years, and now they want to expand their research to the ticks bugging humans. So we have a form that's online where people can fill in their information and then have a little submission form that they can mail in with their tick so we can link the tick to the person. And then our medical entomologist has a little mini lab set up with a microscope and he goes in, he opens them all up, he looks at them, he figures out what they are and then logs both the species as well as when it was found and where it was found. Dr. Natalie Marzik from the State Health Department says this will eventually allow them to build like an online tick tracker that people can check. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a bit of a weather report. Chris on Twitter pointed out to us this headline from the Greeley Trib about the status of a soccer match. No co hail storm, South Georgia Tormenta game postponed due to weather. Tormenta, of course, storm in Spanish. That is just to Colorado. Your feedback next. Feedback tonight from Jim, who corrects something I said earlier about ozone. We we're talking about how you can smell wildfire smoke and you can see wildfire smoke. And I said that you can't see or smell ozone. Jim correctly points out, especially some people can smell ozone. So went to the EPA on this, and here's what the EPA says about the smell of ozone. The ability to detect ozone by smell varies considerably from person to person. And then one's ability to smell ozone rapidly deteriorates in the presence of ozone. It's kind of like anything else. If you're around something that smells, you can only kind of smell it at first. And the EPA continues on this. While the smell of ozone may indicate the concentrations are too high, the lack of odor does not necessarily mean safe levels. That is really interesting. I learned something today thanks to Jim and the EPA. See you next time.